Hello, everyone. My name is David Leclerc. I am technical director of the CAT facility here at the University of Chicago. This is the first of two videos on compensation. Compensation is a topic that we covered in our flow basic class for any new uh, users in our facility. We kind of went through it very quickly and kind of left it hanging as some kind of a flow stamp tree cliffhanger. Uh, it's not really a thing, but uh, what we wanted to do here is go a little bit deeper and help you better think about what it is that we do when we compensate our data. And so this is the figure we use to introduce the problem. What we said is that in traditional flow adapters, the system is designed so that each detector on the instrument is allocated to a specific marker, a specific signal that you're going to be using in your assay. And so you have detector for, in this particular example, FITC, P, and PERCP cell 5.5. Uh, we have a series of dichroic mirrors and bandpass filters that would process the signal and make sure that most of the light coming from each of these different flow force access the specific detector that is allocated in the instrument. Now, what we also said is that the system is somewhat imperfect because of the wide emission range of each of these fluorophores. It's quite possible that the light coming from one fluorophore will bypass the dichroic mirror and end up in the wrong channel generating false positive. That's what we're gonna call spillover or bleeding if you wanna use the cool lingo that us flow stomachists use. So in this our example that we have over here, this is what we're looking at. So we have the green line is my emission of FITC, the yellow line is P, red line is per CP 5.5, the blue rectangle in front of each of our peaks are the bandpass filters for each of my detectors. So we can see that for the FITC detector, we're going to be picking up mostly FITC, but also a slight amount of the P signal. P detector will capture quite a bit of FITC that's spilling over, uh, as we can see over here. And then per CP 5.5, it just so happened that the emission of FITC and P is so far away from these uh, from this detector, these two signals will not bleed so much into that specific detector. That was one of the conclusions that we were saying in the flow basic class. If possible, you would probably want to try to use flow force that do not overlap at all to generate less work for yourself. Now, to discuss spillover, we're going to focus on this example of FITC bleeding in my P channel with the 58542 bandpass filter. If I was to run a sample of cell stain with only FITC, uh, this is the type of data I would expect on the instrument. So we have over here, x-axis is my FITC signal, the P is on the y-axis. Now we have two clusters of cells. We have the negative population that is not stained with anything at all. And then we have my FITC positive stain cluster of cells over here, which is positive on the x-axis, but also positive on the p-axis because of that spillover that we discussed. This is an artifact that makes your data somewhat more complicated to understand and is the, essentially the reason you'll want to do your compensation. It's just a matter of making your data more understandable for reviewers. If you don't do your corrections, you end up with these weird artifacts. So if, for example, if I'm looking at my P channel against side scatter, if you don't do your correction, then you end up with a positive population that is hard to explain until you figure out, oh, this is just an artifact of that poorly corrected spillover issue uh, that I have. To identify spillover issues, uh, there's a couple of things we can look at. One is the diagonal of your positive fraction. Diagonal typically indicates this correlation thing going on. You will have that otherwise if the two markers are co-expressed or if for whatever reason, one antibody attach itself to a second one uh, in your assay. The last reason that might occur is if cells are dying, as they die, everything in the cytoplasm kind of breaks apart and the autofluorescence of the cells increase in all channels simultaneously. That will give you our same diagonal display. More rare, and so in general, when you see a diagonal, that will indicate that as one marker gets brighter and brighter, it bleeds more and more in the secondary channel. Another way of looking at it is looking for these uh, artifact positive fractions that are biologically irrelevant. Uh, if you see that next to your negative population, that typically indicates some kind of problem with the overlap that has not been corrected properly.
they're a different source of spillover. The one we're discussing right now where FITC is bleeding in my P channels, the most common one where a signal excited by a specific laser beam will bleed in the adjacent uh, detectors from the same detector array. However, there are other sources. One of them would be the use of tandem dyes. Uh, tandem dyes are these very noisy molecules that are built from two fluorophore attached to one another. One fluorophore will accept the energy coming from the laser beam, and instead of shooting out a bunch of photons, will transfer that energy through fret to a secondary molecule, uh, which will be the one sending out a bunch of photons. Now, a bit of photons are, is sent by the first molecule, the acceptor molecule in this uh, tandem die, and might end up in the wrong detector. By the same token, the, send, the second molecule might also be excited by a laser beam and also uh, spill in the wrong channel, generating these same uh, false positive. Lastly, we have a case where some fluorophores get excited by multiple laser beams and will shoot a bunch of photons all over the place, uh, possibly in uh, detectors used for other markers in your assay. An example of that would be per CP sub 5.5. It does bleed all over the place. This is why in general, when you build your assay, we recommend using that flow for very late in the game uh, because it's such a, a disruptive flow for. Compensation is one of the different ways we can deal with spectral overlap. There are other ways. Uh, one of them is hardware. So you could design an instrument that will limit the amount of spectral overlap that you'll have between your different floor force. Uh, the best way to do that would be either to use bandpass filters that are really far away from one another so that uh, you have very little chance of having one floor four bleeding into the second one, but it limits the amount of floor fours you can use in the same assay. Another way to do that would be to use multiple laser beams spatially separated with each of them having its own uh, detector array. That will allow you to send specific signal to different detector arrays uh, so that you limit the, the overlap. For example, FITC and P are excited by the blue laser. And so FITC bleeds in my P channel. Now, if I can send my P channel on the 561 laser detector array where FITC is not excited, then I won't have any impact of FITC in that second detector from the di different detector array. So there you go. Another way of doing correction for spectral overlap is to use on mixing, uh, which is more specific to spectral flow cytometry. We're not gonna cover that in this particular video, but below you'll find the link to our wide series of uh, videos on spectral flow cytometry. It's gonna explain on mixing in details. Now let's get into details here. So to do proper composition, we'll need single stain composition controls. These are gonna be cells or beads stained with every single one of your floor force one at a time, you'll essentially have as many controls as you'll have number of markers used in your assay. So back to our example, we have my single stain FITC bleeding in P. This is the data I'm going to observe. So compensation essentially is evaluating the impact of a specific floor for and the other detectors available on the instrument. What we're trying to do is establish a situation where that floor four has no impact whatsoever. So if we look at our data over here, we have our negative population and my FITC positive population that's bleeding in P channel. If I wanted a situation where FITC has no impact on the P channel, I wouldn't want that population to be all the way down over here, where the fluorescence value of my negative population is equal to the autofluorescence value of the FITC positive marker. So that means I'll need to subtract a specific percentage of that signal over here that is bleeding in my P detector. So the equation we're going to use is this one over here. Autofluorescence of the negative fraction in my P channel should be equal to the autofluorescence of the positive fraction in the same channel after I subtracted a specific percentage of my FITC signal. Now the question is, how much percentage do I need to subtract? Is it okay to just guess what it is? And the answer is no, not really. So what we're gonna do here is do the actual compensation for that situation where FITC bleeds in the P channel. We're now in the FCS Express software. We see the same data we've seen in uh, our PowerPoint presentation. I did a couple of things different over here. I drew a couple of gates around 
the negative fraction and the positive fraction. And I pull out the statistics. Uh, we're now looking at the median on the y-axis for each of these population. At the end of the conversation, the value of that median for the negative population should be equal to the median of the FITSI positive fraction. We're using the median, by the way, because it's much better when you do your flow to use median over a mean. Uh, it's less sensitive to outliers. The second thing I want to point out before we actually do the composition is that I am using a bike exponential display. Uh, that basically pulls the data away from the axis and gives me a better view of what's going to happen. The reason I want to use the bike exponential display is that I'm going to end up with negative fluorescent value as I subtract the percentage of my signal. Um, that doesn't really make sense in real life, but this is your Gaussian superpower. Now, if I was to use a log scale, all these negative values would be stuck against the axis and it would be very hard to visualize uh, if I did my composition properly. Now, in FCS Express, I have this tool here that I can use the composition tool. I have a matrix I made that's called you shall not spill. And that will allow me to subtract a percentage of my FITSI signal bleeding in my P channel. As I increase this value over here, we'll see the median uh, value go down a bit by bit. So if I go to 3% first, I can see that the value shrank to about 233. So and my artifact over here is slowly disappearing. If I go to five, still not quite there. The artifact is still present, but it's slowly going away. My median is now at 115. If I guess, oh, I don't know, 6.9. Now I have virtually the same values for the median of the negative and the median of the positive. There's slight difference between the two. That's widely accepted. That's fine. My artifact completely disappeared. So now we can say this competition is done properly and we can move on with our life. If I increase the value to something higher, now the population kind of curves down and now we're overcompensating our data. And my median value is at minus 173. My negative artifact is now on the left-hand side of that population. So one thing to keep in mind, that presence of the artifact is an easy way to identify uh, the issues with your spectral overlap correction. Now, if you understand what we have done here for the correction of FITSI in the P channel, you basically understand competition in general. From there on, competition is going to be the sublime repetition of this particular exercise for every single floor four you have in your assay for all the detectors that you are using to measure your different signals. Uh, so it's just more of the same going forward. So as you increase the number of markers in your assay, it gets really tedious to uh, repeat that correction for every single detector for every single floor four that you're using. Uh, all of these different markers spill into each other like crazy. And at some point, it gets out of hand to try to do it manually. So that's why at some point, we'll suggest doing your composition using a wizard. Uh, that's what you'll find in most uh, analysis software available on the market. Flojo has one, FCS Express has one, Diva, and so on. The way they work is pretty straightforward. You simply need to load your single stain controls in the software and basically tell the software what population of cells you need to study, where are the positive and negative fractions, and then the software will simply calculate all of these overlaps between the different floor force automatically and, and spit out the matrix that you can use to analyze your data. We recommend double checking on the composition that's been done by the software. You can easily do that by using N by N plots, which essentially allows you to look at everything against everybody else. That will allow you to quickly identify a specific problems of data that has not been properly uh, compensated, such as we have in this particular graph here. Now, all these composition values are stored in a composition matrix. That is basically what the software will use to form how to deal with the raw data and deal with the spectral overlap that you had in your assay. Later on, this composition matrix is inversed and transformed in a spillover matrix. That will tell us the level of spillover between 
the different flow force in your assay. Now these two, the concession matrix and the spillover matrix are somewhat used sometimes interchangeably, which cause a bit of confusion. So here's something to help you differentiate which is which. So first, the composition matrix will be saved independently in its own data file. The composition matrix can be called in during your analysis to inform how to deal with the spectral overlap. However, that composition matrix is dependent on the software where it was generated. So if you did your composition in Flojo, in FCS Express, or in whatever software, the composition matrix can only be read within the same analysis software. So in that sense, the composition matrix is software dependent. The spillover matrix, on the other hand, is embedded in your data file. There's a keyword within that FCS file called uh, dollar sign spillover that can be called in during the analysis so that the software will know how to deal with the spectral overlap you had between your flow force. That can be used on any software, Flojo, FCS Express, uh, whatever analysis software you prefer. And in that sense, the spillover matrix is software agnostic. Keep in mind that the data file contains the raw measurements for each of your detectors, and you can always redo your compensation over and over again until you get to results that actually works. If you did your compensation during the acquisition and completely messed it up, it doesn't really matter. You can always apply a new compensation on top of your raw data and just ignore whatever you've done during your acquisition. Now, we can't really talk about compensation without talking about the compensation control rules. If you've seen a few presentations about composition or panel design, stuff like that, you might have noticed that whenever people present these uh, rules, they always change a little bit. They're never exactly the same number might change as well. And so in that sense, I think it's important to realize that those rules are more tips on how to prepare the very best controls for your compensation. What I want to do here is use the five rules we presented in our flow basic class and basically put them in context of the equation we already discussed in hopes that it will better clarify uh, what we're shooting for when you prepare these controls. So again, that equation is the autofluorescence of my negative fraction will be equal to the autofluorescence of the positive fraction after I subtracted a percentage of that flow for uh, that has no business being in there. So the first two rules we're going to point out is that your control needs a positive and negative fraction, and you need to collect enough events in both of these fractions. And these two are essentially there to make sure that your positive and negative fractions are really well defined. You really want a good number of events in both of these so that the statistics you can pull out of each of these fractions are really strong. If there are uncertainties in the level of brightness of the different population of cells, whatever you're going to be calculating will be a rough guess at best. And so the more events you have in each fractions, the more certain you are that you're measuring the correct group of events. The next two rules, make sure that you're comparing the same stuff. So the first one says both fraction must have the same autofluorescence value. So this is fundamental. If the goal is to subtract the percentage of a signal falling into the wrong detector so that the autofluorescence of one fraction is equal to the fraction of the autofluorescence of the positive fraction. Obviously, you want the autofluorescence to be the same to begin with. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. So that translates into making sure that you are not mixing, for example, uh, cells and beads within the same control. You can always have within different control sets, cells or beads. What you can do is have a positive fraction being beads and the negative one being cells, for example. This also holds true if you're comparing different type of cells. If you are controlling for a marker that is specific to splenocytes, you want to be sure that the cells that are included for the calculation of the autofluorescent values only includes these cells and not bigger cells, for example, macrophage that might be uh, much, much brighter and will impact the calculation of that autofluorescence value. Second rules, you must use the same floor force. So there's a couple of things here. It used to be that in some case, because people couldn't get proper controls, they would, for example, use a FITC single stain control for composition on a GFP signal, thinking both of them are excited by the same blue laser and emits in roughly the same channel. 
So that should be fine. It's simply not something you can do here. FITC is simply not a good predictor of what GFP will do in front of the laser beam in the other channels. And so you really want the exact same flow for, for each and every one of your controls. Adding to that point, we can talk about the tandem dyes, which will break apart over time due to mostly exposure to ambient light. Two P size seven that have different age will not react the same way in front of the laser beam and will develop different spectral signature over time. And so it's really important when you prepare your controls to use the exact same valuement body for your control and your sample so that whatever you calculate in your compensation matrix will apply properly to your data. Furthermore, you might have noticed that lately, the brand new dyes that are coming out on the market have really weird names that essentially tells us the excitation and mission of these fluorophores, but it doesn't tell us anything about whether they're single molecules or tandem dyes. So for example, BV421 is a single molecule, BV605, BV711 are tandem dyes. You won't know that until you dig a little bit. To avoid that kind of worm, we just recommend using the same value antibody for your controls and your sample. The last rule says that the passive control must be as bright or brighter than what you'll find in your sample. And this is simply a matte thing. Uh, you want to have a control which is as bright as possible so you can positively figure out what's going to happen with the dimmer signal that you'll find in your sample. If the reverse is true and your control is dimmer than what you'll find in your sample, you end up extrapolating what's going to happen with that, uh, with that sample. You might get lucky and be correct, but that's unlikely to happen. And you're going to be stuck with the composition matrix that simply will not work for your actual sample. So keep that in mind. When you extrapolate, you made extra of Paul and Nate. Now, a few things before we close this presentation. Uh, I wanted to discuss a few claims made by manufacturers of instruments uh, regarding their instruments. The first one is uh, from BD when they talk about their fax lyric. Uh, the quote says, a single 20 minute procedure also determines gain independent spillover values that are valid for 60 days with variation of less than 0.5%. Uh, so essentially that means that you could do your compensation at some point and keep the same compensation matrix for the same experiment all the way for the next two months or so. Second quote is from Beckman Coulter. They're talking about their Cytoflex platform. Uh, the measured intensity are linear to the detector gain setting across the wide range of gain settings. As a result, Site Expert, which is the software that runs uh, the Cytoflex, can calculate the changes in spillover based on the changes in gain settings. So essentially, the detectors on the Cytoflex is so awesome and so linear that you could uh, run one experiment with one set of gains on these detectors and run that same experiment later on with a different set of gains and essentially uh, let the software recalculate the compensation matrix without having to run the controls again. Now, I'm not going to challenge these claims. I suspect that they're actually correct in specific well-controlled environments, which is not your environment very likely that you live in. It makes really little sense to talk about the stability of a compensation matrix over time when you don't control for the stability of the reagents that you're going to be using in your assay. I'm thinking specifically about the tandem dyes, which get banged up over time. It really doesn't matter that the instrument is really stable if the reagents are not, and the composition matrix will simply not be usable uh, in those cases. So whenever you see these type of claims, you need to keep in mind that the manufacturers are probably talking to a specific group of researchers working in the clinical environment. Most core facilities will actually ignore these type of claims, and, and we still recommend running uh, your full set of controls for every single one of the experiments that you're going to be doing uh, in our facilities. And we actually have colleagues who looked into this claim, and from the looks of it, uh, they're not a huge fan of the idea of reusing composition matrix uh, over time. Last point, uh, for several years, we talked about spectral viewers as a way to predict the level of spectral overlap you can expect as you design your panel. If you use them, you might have noticed that they are not always completely accurate. Uh, we have an example over here where Fitzy is the green line, the blue line is my BV421. And from the looks of it, they are right on top of each other, 
and they should not be used uh, together. Now, if you've done a bit of flow, you know FITC and VV510 works quite well. So what's going on here? Essentially, we're not getting the full information for, from the Spectra viewers. I would recommend starting using the Spectra Analyzer uh, going forward. Uh, spectral analyzers are these tools that were developed in conjunction with uh, spectral flow stamters. What we're going to see here is the full emission of any given flow of force uh, as they've been run on a spectral flow stamper. Uh, in most cases, it's going to be the Cytec Aurora. Uh, and so what we have are the different detectors from each of these arrays allocated to each of our laser beams. We have the UV laser detector array, the detector array for the violet laser, for the blue laser, yellow, green, and red. And we can see that the BV421 mostly emits in the detector array of the violet laser. FITC is concentrated in the blue laser detector array. They do not overlap at all and are totally fine to be used uh, together. So spectral analyzer provides somewhat more accurate data. And even though it's a tool developed for spectral flow stamps, it actually reflects what's going to happen on traditional flow as well. And so in that sense, it's a really, really nice tool uh, to start using when you develop your, your different panels. That concludes the first part of the competition series. Uh, in the second installment, I want to revisit a DECA slide that I really like. It was created by Thomas Miles Hashers, as well as Adrian Lloyd Smith from the uh, Sydney Cytometry Corps. Uh, and it's actually very popular in the flow stamp tree field. Uh, if you've seen a few presentation on panel design, you've likely come across some figures pulled out from that presentation uh, that may or may not have been properly um, acknowledged. I've never actually seen that talk live, uh, but it deals with the impact of your voltage and gain settings on composition values, uh, and ultimately on the resolution between the different clusters of cells in your sample. So it's really useful, really interesting uh, topics to me. And what's really cool is that it does that by telling a story that's really relatable. Um, it's essentially a researcher presenting data to a supervisor and supervisor looks at the composition values and, and spots some that are really high and goes like, what is this? This is way too high. It's not properly compensated. Do you know how to compensate? You don't know how to compensate. You don't know anything. You're fired. Fired. Get out of here. And the researcher is completely shocked, shocked, dazed, and confused, looks in the distance, doesn't know what to do, uh, thinks to himself, how am I going to feed my children? And what's the problem with high compensation values to begin with? The researcher sadly looks through the window and see the moon falling between the mountain peaks. And in the distant plain, the rooster sings. This is a flow stamp tree cliffhanger.